Unit 1 Review The purpose of this video is to review the topics from Unit 1. These topics are normal stress in axially loaded members, average shear stress in simple shear conditions, allowable stress, and normal and shear strain. Use the times shown to jump to a specific topic. First, normal stress. As we will learn in this class, normal stress can be formed in various ways. So far, we have only considered the normal stress that occurs in an axially loaded member, or a member that's loaded along its longitudinal axis. Normal stress in an axially loaded member is caused by the internal normal force, which I'm showing here with the letter N. We can calculate normal force when we cut a member and find the force that is normal to the cut. Normal stress is equal to the normal force divided by the cross-section area of that cut. And in this class, we will take the cut perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the member. So the area is the smallest cross-sectional area that we can have on a cut surface. We assume that the distribution of normal stress is uniform across the full surface of the member. A few notes. Normal stress, sigma, may be in compression or tension. We show compression with a negative sign, and we show tension with a positive sign. The units on normal stress are the same for shear stress. U.S. customary units, they will be in pounds of force divided by area square inches. More useful is kips divided by square inches, which we sometimes show as PSI or KSI. In the international system, the units are force newtons divided by area meters squared. One newton per meter squared is one pascal. A more useful unit for stress is megapascals, or one million pascals. Okay, so here's an example problem where we have a rod with some loads on it, and we are asked to find the maximum stress in the rod. And we can see this this rod is loaded with uh, intention. So we're going to be looking for the normal stress. And the equation we're going to use is sigma is equal to normal force over area. So uh, we can get the area from the cross section. What we need to find is, is the normal force. And we're asked to find the max stress, the maximum in the rod. So we'll get maximum normal stress when we have our maximum normal force, since it looks like our cross section is continuous throughout. So where is the maximum normal force? Well, if we, if we inspect the problem, we will see that if we cut it somewhere in the upper rod, there'll be, that's where we'll find the maximum force. So here's a free body diagram where I've made a cut somewhere in the upper rod and I show the normal force acting on the cut. If I sum forces in the y direction, I can get what that normal force is. And I find that the normal force is 5 kilonewtons. So I'll find the normal stress in the upper rod by taking the normal force, 5 kilonewtons or 5,000 newtons, and dividing it by the cross-sectional area. The cross-section is a square with 20 millimeters on each side. I want to convert this into units of meters so that I'll have newtons per meter squared as my unit pascal. And when I solve uh, for normal stress, I get it's uh, 12.5 million pascals. This is the same as 12.5 megapascals, and that's the maximum stress in the rod. Now, let's talk about average shear stress. And as you will see in this class, shear stress can be produced in multiple ways. What we have considered so far is a simple shear condition, as shown in the figure on the left. Here, two plates are bolted together. When forces are applied to the plates, as shown, the bolt shank experiences simple shear. A free body diagram of the bolt shank is shown on the right. Shear stress in the bolt shank is caused by an internal shear force. We can see the internal shear force when we cut through the bolt shank, as shown in the bottom figure. On the cut surface, the force parallel to the surface is the shear force, shown with a V. Let's take a closer look at the free body diagram. In this case, the shear force V is equal to the load applied to the shank P. 
we can visualize the shear stress as the shear force being distributed over the surface. And we can calculate the average shear stress as the shear force V divided by the cross-sectional area of the cut surface. A few notes. For shear stress, no sign is given. Negative or positive shear stress don't really mean anything since they are dependent on the perspective of the viewer. So we will always take the magnitude of shear force V and put into our equation and drop any sign. The units are the same for shear stress as they are for normal stress. We refer to the shear condition in the bolt shank in the figure as single shear. Here's a situation of double shear. In this case, we have a clevis connected to a rod with a single pin. In this case, the force in the rod is split through the pin into the two arms of the clevis. If this pin were to fail, it would fail in two locations. The free body diagram at the bottom of the screen shows how the force in the rod, P0, is split into two. We calculate the average shear stress as shear force over area. If we consider just one cross section, the internal shear force on that cross section is P0 divided by 2. And we calculate shear stress as P0 over 2 divided by the area of the pin. Another way to look at this is to say that the full load P0 is spread over two cross sectional areas. Either way we solve this, we get the same average shear stress. Okay, so here's a problem where we have a pin and shear. If you see the diagram, there are, uh, from a top view, we've got uh, plates on the left and a plate on the right with a single pin with a circular cross section. And with a side view, we see on the left there are two plates, and on the right there is one plate and with one pin uh, penetrating all three plates. So this is a condition of, uh, of simple shear, and we would call this a double shear condition. And we want to find the average stress. So the equation we're going to use, since this is shear, average shear stress is equal to V over A. Now the area of the, this is the area of the pin, and uh, we, we are given the pin diameter, so we'll be able to calculate area. So what we need to do is find what is the shear force on the pin. It can be helpful to draw a free body diagram of the pin. So I'm showing the pin with the loads that are being applied to the pin as transferred through the plates. And we see a, uh, a load on the middle plate uh, causing 500 pounds on the pin. And then that 500 pounds gets split uh, into two 250 pound forces. So this pin is, uh, is still in static equilibrium. And now I have made a cut through the pin and drawn a free body diagram of the top third of that pin. And we can see that there's a force of 250 pounds on it, and on the cut is my shear force V. And we see from statics that V is equal to 250 pounds. So I'll take V and put it into my equation for average shear stress, 250 pounds divided by the area. And the area is the cross-sectional area of the pin on the cut on which the shear force V is acting. And solving for average shear stress, I get that it is equal to 5,093 PSI. I can also write this as 5.09 KSI. Allowable stress. The allowable stress in these equations is the magnitude of stress we are willing to allow in our structural member. The failure stress is the stress level at which the material we are designing with fails. This is typically known for a given material. Often we use the yield strength as our failure stress. Fs, or factor of safety, is typically a given value in this course. The factor of safety is always going to be a number that is greater than or equal to 1. Note that if we have a factor of safety of 2, then if we apply this in our equation, we will find that the allowable stress is equal to one-half the failure stress. This means the maximum stress we allow in a product is equal to only half of the failure stress. This gives us a safety factor to ensure that our product will not fail under normal use. 
In this class, the factor of safety is going to be given. In practice, the factor of safety might be dictated by a building code or selected based on some analysis. Allowable stress and a factor of safety can be used to design simple connections. For example, if we know the material we are using and we know its failure stress, we can compute an allowable stress. We can then set the allowable stress equal to the average stress equation normal force divided by area. We can then rewrite the equation to solve for area. With this equation, if we know the normal force and we know the allowable stress or the stress that we're going, the maximum stress that we will allow in our product, we can solve for the minimum area required. For example, if I wanted to size the rod that is being pulled on in this figure, and I know the normal force, and I know the material with which it will be built, and its failure stress, and a factor of safety, I can compute the required minimum cross-sectional area. This applies to simple shear connections as well. I can compute an allowable stress and set it equal to the average shear stress equation. Rewriting to solve for area allows me to size, for example, a pin that is experiencing simple shear if I know the shear force in the pin and I know the allowable shear stress. Okay, so here's another simple shear condition where I've got three plates. Uh, in this, this case, they're pinned together with two pins. And it says, find the pin diameter required to the nearest millimeter that works. I'll explain more what I mean there in just a sec. So what we're trying to find is what, what size pin do we need for this connection? And we're given that the pin has a failure stress of 200 megapascals. And we're going to use a factor of safety of 1.25. So let's go ahead and start by, let's figure out what our allowable stress is. So I'll say tau allowable. And Using the equation for tau allowable, which is the failure stress divided by the factor of safety, I get that our allowable stress in the pin is going to be 160 megapascals. That means we've got to size our pin so that the stress does not exceed 160 megapascals. So the next step is to use our shear stress equation, our average shear stress, which is the shear force divided by area we're going to set that equal to tau allowable and solve for area. So that's our equation, written to solve for area. I'm going to draw a free body diagram of the pin. Now I'm just going to draw one pin. So uh, I think we can uh, safely assume that the 6 kilonewton load that's being applied to the plates is, uh, is going to get shared equally by the two pins. So that means one pin is going to be pulled to the right with six or with six kilonewtons divided by two, three kilonewtons, and to the left, 1.5 kilonewtons for each plate. So drawing another free body diagram of the top portion of that pin, I see that the shear force within the pin is going to be 1.5 kilonewtons. And now I can solve for the area, the cross-sectional area where that shear force is occurring, is going to be the, the shear force 1500 newtons divided by the allowable stress. And notice what I've done with the units here. I'm, I've got to make my units match. And I've got 160 times 10 to the 6. It's mega, a million newtons per meter squared. So my answer, notice, in my area is going to come out in units of meters squared. That means it's going to be a pretty small number. And then I'll, I'll convert that into millimeters. Okay, so sure enough, my area comes out to be very small. And what I'm looking for is the diameter. So what I'm going to do is solve for diameter. So I can get the diameter by taking the square root of 4 times the area divided by pi. And I get that the diameter required is 3.45 times 10 to the negative third meters. And converting that to millimeters, I get that it is 3.45 millimeters. So not very big. But I need to design it, uh, I need to find the pin diameter to the nearest millimeter that works. So I can't use a mathematical rounding rules because then I'd round down to three. If that's a smaller 
diameter pin. What I've got here, this is my minimum diameter. I cannot go below 3.45. So what I'll do is I will round up to the nearest millimeter and say it's got to be a 4 millimeter diameter pin in this, uh, in this connection. Now let's look at normal and shear strain. First, let's look at normal strain. Suppose we have a rod with two points, a distance L0 apart. If I pull on that rod in tension, the distance between those two points increases. The change is delta. The final length between the two points is L prime. I can calculate the average normal strain as the final length, L prime, minus the original length, L0, divided by the original length, L0. Another way to write this equation is the average normal strain is equal to the change in length delta divided by the original length. Note that if I subject the rod to a compression force, the distance between the two points gets shorter. That does not change our equation, but notice what happens to sine. If L prime is less than L naught, then the average normal strain will be negative. In this case, the change delta is shrinking, and therefore the delta is negative. In summary, if the average normal strain is positive, the distance between the two points increased. If the average normal strain is negative, the distance between the two points decreased. Note the units completely cancel out. We have length on the top and length on the bottom. But it is customary to show the units in inches per inch or millimeters per millimeter just to show that the units were not forgotten. Here's a normal strain problem like you might see on a quiz. It says the rectangular block is deformed as shown by the dotted lines. Find the normal strain between points B and D. Now notice the uh, the strain, the deformations shown are not to uh, not to scale but they're exaggerated a little bit so that it becomes clear what we're trying to do. So here's the equation we're going to use. The normal strain between two points is equal to the uh, the new length after it's been deformed minus the original length divided by the original length. So we just need to get our lengths. So let's start by finding our original length. Okay, so I've shown L0, the original length, on the diagram. And uh, we can find that with Pythagorean theorem. Conveniently, it works out to be 500 millimeters. Now we need to find our new length, L prime. Now, I've shown L prime on the diagram. That is the deformed length from points B to point D. Now, you should know in a problem like this, you don't need to worry about uh, needing law of sines or law of cosines. You can solve this again with just the Pythagorean theorem. Let me show you. So, I've dropped a line. I went up to the new deformed point B, and I dropped a line straight down. And I went to the new location of D in a deformed position and drew a line horizontally over and where those intersected, that formed a right angle. So what I have here is a, uh, is a new right triangle shown in blue. And I can find the dimensions of that right triangle. For example, this bottom leg is going to be 400 millimeters. It got shorter at point A by uh, by four, that's this four right here. That's it got shorter by that amount, but it increased by two. That's this amount here. So my new length then is 400 minus four plus two, 398 millimeters. And the vertical leg, we'll use the same uh, logic. It's it was originally 300. At point A, it shrunk by four. But at point B, it increased by 2. So the net length is now 298 millimeters. Now that I know the side length, I can find the hypotenuse, L prime, using the Pythagorean theorem. And I find that it is 497.2 millimeters. Now I'll put those values into my strain equation. And I calculate a small number, which is very typical for strain. Notice it's negative. This makes sense because the length got shorter. So uh, when it gets shorter, we expect to see a negative normal strain. Next, shear strain. Suppose we have a body, 
and we draw two orthogonal lines on that body to create a coordinate system. The angle between the two lines is pi over two radians, or 90 degrees. Now if we subject that body to shear forces, the body will deform, and so will our coordinate system. The angle between the two lines shown is no longer a right angle, we will say it is theta prime. We can compute the average shear strain as pi over 2 minus theta prime. In other words, the average shear strain is the change in the angle. Note that the units here are in radians. Okay, so I'm going to recycle this problem. Except now it says the rectangular block is deformed as shown by the dotted lines. Find the shear strain at corner B. So here's the equation for shear strain. Uh, it's equal to pi over 2 minus theta prime. Now the pi over 2 is the original angle at corner B. It is a right angle, so it's pi over 2 radians. It's, that's equivalent to 90 degrees. The theta prime is the new angle. Now let me draw that on here. This is the new angle. It's theta prime. That's what we need to find. So the way I'm going to solve this problem is by making right triangles. I've gone now to corner B and I've divided it up into three angles. From point B I dropped a line straight down all the way down to A and, uh, and then over to point A and I created a right triangle there and I'm going to call that angle, that little wedge angle, alpha. And then I went back to point B and drew a line straight over until I was just uh, just below the new point C and then I drew a line straight back up to new point C and uh, that formed a little right angle, little wedge, and I'm going to call this angle shown as beta. And then between the blue line, the blue horizontal line, and the red vertical line I have a, uh, a 90 degree or pi halves angle there. So these three angles, alpha, beta, and then this right angle in the middle all sum up to theta prime. So now uh, pi halves, that's already in the right units, that's radians, so I just need to find ang the angles alpha and beta in units of radians. And I can do that with the information shown. Let me show you. Using trigonometry, I can write that the tangent of alpha is equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side. And the opposite side is this of this wedge angle alpha is this dimension here, that's the 4 millimeters. And the adjacent side is is uh, the other leg. It was 300 millimeters and then it got stretched by 2 millimeters up to the new point B. So, um, so it's going to be 302 millimeters long. So I changed my calculator mode to radians and I computed alpha by taking the ta inverse tangent of 4 over 302 and I got this value shown. Now remember that this is a small angle because it's less than about 0.05 radians or about 3 degrees so I can drop the trigonometric function and I get just about the same answer at least to, to however many significant digits really matter. And don't forget the units are radians. Now I can find the angle beta the same way. I'm going to take the opposite side and uh, and divide it by the adjacent side. Now the opposite side, this is interesting, uh, at point C it grew by 6, at point B it only grew by 2, so the net result, that's a 4, so my opposite side is a 4. And the adjacent side is uh, it was 400, it shrunk by 4, that's 396, but it grew by 3. So that's a net shrink by 1, so 399. And again, I'm assuming it's a small angle, and I compute it, and it comes out to be 0 0.01003, and that's less than 0 0.05, so it is a small angle, that's confirmed. Radians. So I can compute my theta prime is going to be the sum of alpha, plus beta, plus pi over 2. And I find I get 1.5941 radians. So I'm going to go and insert that back up into our equation for gamma and calculate the shear strain at corner B. 
and I calculate that it is negative 0 0.0233 radians, a small number. That's usually the case. The negative sign is there because the angle actually got larger. Theta prime is bigger than pi over 2, and that happens when the uh, when we get a, uh, after the deformation, the angle is bigger than it was when we started. This concludes the review of Unit 1 topics.